I've always been a big fan of palindromes, especially palindromes that tell a story, like this one. Able was I, ere I saw Elba. Now the I in this case refers to Napoleon Bonaparte, who by all accounts was a very able general. And Elba refers to the fact that Napoleon was eventually exiled from France to the tiny island of Elba off the coast of Italy. But by far, my favorite palindrome has to be this one. A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. The man in this case refers to Teddy Roosevelt and his plan to build a canal through the Isthmus of Panama. Now this brilliant plan meant that goods could be shipped from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast in half the time, and it was a huge economic boon for the United States. But if you ask me, this palindrome is almost equally brilliant. It was created by Lee Mercer, an expert at wordplay and recreational mathematics, two of my favorite subjects. Here's another brilliant creation from the mind of Mercer. Now the mathematics at work in this formula are nothing special, but what is special is that this is a poem. And not just any kind of poem, but a limerick. That means it has to follow a very specific rhythm and rhyme. But to read this properly, first I should point out that 12 should be read here as a dozen, and 144 should be read as a gross, or a dozen dozen. 20 should be read as a score, like Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago. So now, we're ready to give it a go. A dozen, a gross, and a score, plus three times the square root of four. Divided by seven, plus five times 11, is nine squared and not a bit more. Now this is undeniably brilliant, and I think that the only reason it didn't receive international attention is because it only really works in English. Not just because of the rhythm and the rhyme, but the fact that most languages have no idea what a dozen or a gross are. And that's what I really want to talk about, the dozenal or the base 12 system, also called duodecimal. Most people these days use the decimal system or base 10 system. And the reason given is that humans have 10 fingers that we use for counting. But proponents of the base 12, or duodecimal system, will be quick to point out that on the human finger, there's actually three sections separated by joints, which are easy to point to with the thumb, making it easy to count to 12 on one hand. Go ahead and give it a try. It's easier than you think. In fact, you can also keep track of how many dozens that you've counted on the other hand, which means that with just two hands, you can count to 144. Actually, in ancient times, lots of societies used the base 12 system instead of base 10. For example, the Babylonians had a 12-hour day. The Romans used a system of measurement called uncia, which is based on 12. An uncia is one twelfth of a Roman pound. By the way, you may have already known that the word libra is the reason that pound is abbreviated as LB, but what you may not have known is that uncia is where we get the English word ounce and also inch. But probably the best example of a base 12 system is the ancient Chinese who used something called the 12 earthly branches for cardinal directions, a 12 hour clock, a 12 month calendar, and the 12 Chinese signs of the zodiac. Some people have suggested that English is also a base 12 language, as we have unique names for 11 and 12. But a closer look shows that these words come from the Proto-Germanic words Einlif and Twalif, or one left and two left. This indicates that English is more likely a base 10 language, despite British currency and imperial units often being based on 12. But there's a good reason that so many people use the duodecimal system. It's way better than the decimal system. That's because 12 is what's called a superior, highly composite number. Composite means sort of the opposite of prime. It means that it can be divided. And a highly composite number means that it can be divided a lot by a lot of different numbers. Let's take a look at what that means then. 
consider the factors first of 10. It only really has two, two and five, and both of those are prime. But now look at the factors of 12. It can be divided by two, three, four, and six. That's twice as many factors. And here's why that matters for things like arithmetic. First, let's take a look at fractions. Now here are the most common fractions that we use in day-to-day -day life. One half, one third, two thirds, one quarter, and three quarters. And here's what those look like in decimal. 0 0.5, 0 0.333 repeating, 0 0.666 repeating, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, Especially pay attention to the one-third and the two-thirds here. These are non-terminating digits, which means that they keep going forever. They're not only messy, but they're clumsy. Now let's look at how duodecimal handles these. One-half is actually 0 0.6, since 6 is half of 12. That means that one-third is 0 0.4, two-thirds is 0 0.8, one-quarter is 0 0.3, and three quarters is 0 0.9. Remember how frustrated you were when you found out that 0 0.9 repeating was not just close to one, but actually equal to one? Well, in duodecimal, you don't have that problem anymore. It becomes clean and simple, but we're just getting started. Let's see how duodecimal handles time. Now imagine that the clock looks like this. In decimal time, that means it would be 1215. Only we don't call it 12.15, we call it a quarter past 12. But to get there, first we have to take the minute hand, which is pointing to 3, and then multiply that times 5 to get 15 minutes. Then we have to remember that an hour is 60 minutes, so 15 over 60 is equal to a quarter of an hour, which is written as 0.25. Now let's see how elegantly duodecimal handles it. To do that, we're gonna bring those fraction charts out again. Remember now that one quarter is no longer 0.25, but now it's 0.3. In other words, exactly where the minute hand was already pointing. Let's look at 1220 then. Instead of multiplying four by five to get 20 minutes, which we know is one third of a 60 minute hour, we can just see that one-third equals 0 0.4 in duodecimal. In other words, the hour hand and the minute hand are always pointing precisely on the correct numbers without having to multiply by five all the time. This is true for half past the hour and also a quarter to the hour. But there's something else that duodecimal does well, circles. Because a circle is 360 degrees, it can easily be divided into subsets and supersets of 12. A 360 degree circle can be broken into 30 sets of 12. Let's take a look at what that looks like on our globe. As you can see here, the globe is divided into 12 equal parts divided by meridians, with the prime meridian being at zero degrees and each subsequent meridian being spaced out at 30 degrees. Let's rotate that on its end to get a better look at the angles. You should notice that it looks an awful lot like a clock, and this isn't by mistake. The way that we tell time is based on which part of the circle that the sun is shining on. After all, the predecessor to modern clocks was a sundial. And since these meridians are also used for navigation, you can see that when we say minutes in terms of navigation, it's even closer to the minutes of time than we may have realized. And since people in ancient times divided the night sky into 30 degree slices as well, we can see that there are 12 signs of the zodiac. And since the months are based on the circular orbit and circular rotation of the moon, we can also see how we arrived at a 12 month calendar as well. The question then remains, how should we write it? And how should we pronounce numbers in duodecimal? Well, since 12 is the new radix, in other words, the number that we use to start over, we should write it with a one and a zero, just like 10 is written now. But that leaves us with the task of how to write 10 and 11. The simplest solution suggested was that we just abbreviate them to T and E. 
Other people have suggested that we use the Greek letters delta and epsilon from the Greek words for 10 and 11. The Dozenal Society of Great Britain proposed using an inverted 2 and a 3. And you can see by the fact that I was able to type these on my computer that they at least got as far as including those in Unicode. But my personal favorite is the system adopted by the Dozenal Society of America to use the asterisk and the hash. This would allow people to use modern telephones without having to change anything. By the way, the real name for a six-pointed asterisk is a sextile and an eight-pointed hash is called an octothorpe. I suggest that we start calling them by these names from now on. The last thing then is to actually show how basic arithmetic would work in a duodecimal system. Let's take for example the number five times five. As you can see here, it's written in the same way that 21 is written in decimal. Only this is no longer the tens place, it's the twelves place. And since there are two of them, that means it's 24, plus the one that's in the ones place, which makes it equal to 25. Let's try another one just to make sure we get it. This time, we'll try 8 times 9, which looks like the number 60. Again, remember that there's a 6 in the twelves place. That means that it's actually 72. It might seem like a lot of work, but that's just because you're used to decimal counting. Duodecimal advocate A.C. Aitken said of these multiplication tables, the duodecimal tables are easy to master, easier than the decimal ones, and in elementary teaching, they would be so much more interesting since young children would find more fascinating things to do with 12 rods or blocks than with 10. Anyone having these tables at command will do these calculations more than one and a half times as fast in the duodecimal scale as in the decimal. This is my experience. I am certain that even more so, it would be the experience of others. If you ask me, I think it's time people started to adopt the duodecimal scale by the dozens.